Ladies and gentlemen, you are tuned into another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. There are singers and there are songwriters. Then there are singer-songwriters who can sing their own songs, but also put an indelible stamp on another song. Marshall Chapman is an icon of Americana, a singer, songwriter, actor, author, teller of stories, a great spoken word artist. As a recording artist, her albums have been heralded by music lovers and the press. In fact, it was just a couple weeks ago, I turned off the lights late at night. I went back to her very first album, and I sailed away, all the way to the present day. She has a new album coming out. This is number 14. It's a great album. You look at the cover, and it just draws you in from the beginning. It's called Songs I Can't Live Without. So, Marshall Chapman, it is a great honor to talk to you yet again. Thanks, Paul. Great talking to you again, too. Well, I I think uh, this album is is real as you were telling me before we went on the air. It's it's really making an impression on the press, but also the people that have heard it. There's some great things that people have said, and I want to just read a couple of them. This one comes from the great Tommy Womack. He said <laughs> she inhabited them, and that's the kind of the feeling I got when I was listening to this. And then William Broyles Jr. He called it haunting, evocative, and impossibly fresh. Now, for anyone who hasn't heard this album yet, uh, which this was an advance that I got, it's a moody album. There's yeah. You really heard nothing like it. But what do you think, Marshall Chapman, about this new album of yours? <laughs> I mean, I love it, you know. I wouldn't put it out. I, got, I just got to be honest. I, I I love the way it came out. I didn't, you know, you don't know what you're doing when you're recording. You're you're in a room. I try to surround myself with with great talent, and and there was, but but there were fewer people in the room than any other album I've ever made. And I feel like we quietly made more noise than I did when we were using Marshall amps stacked up, all of them turned up to eleven. You know, it has sort of a quiet. Um, power to it and it it feels great I'm, I'm so happy with the way it turned out and i'm just grateful i lived long enough i got to live long enough to make it you know i'll tell you i'm sitting here nielsen hubbard is the reason i'm i made this record because i wasn't you know i went through a lot of trauma five years ago and um my marriage ended my mother died the day after my divorce was final and then i was hospitalized a week later and I was really depleted and full of despair, and I just thought I'm not I'm not doing music anymore. I, I really, so I kind of turned to movies because I thought it was going to be easier. <laughs> but they do have better insurance. But I did this movie, and they wanted me to. I, I was playing the. We were filming in New Orleans, and I was playing the mother of a character played by Ryan Reynolds, um, and she was like a badass. We, we shot this in a transvestite bar in New Orleans and they wanted me to sing a song that had the word rainbow in it. And at first they wanted me to write a song that had the word rain. And I wrote a really good song called rainbow in my mind. And then they changed their mind and said, you know, it needs to be a song that that's been around that everybody knows. Cause you know, because of the backstory and the script. And so they asked me to choose. They sent me a bunch of songs that had Rainbow in the title. Of course, I chose Rainbow Road that was written by Dan Penn and Johnny Fritz because they're two songwriters I respect as much as any songwriters on the planet. And I know these guys and they're, you know, they're the great Muscle Shoals guys. And so I chose Rainbow Road and they they sent Joan Baez's version. And so I called Donnie and he said, yeah, nobody's ever sung the right words to this song. I said, well, what are they? And I, I wanted to get it from the horse's mouth. So I wrote down the words just as he wrote them. And then the producer of this movie down in New Orleans, 
they wanted me to record that song for the movie, for a very pivotal scene in the movie, and you can hear it. And it's also on the soundtrack. And they wanted me to do it with this young producer, up and coming producer in Nashville named Nielsen Hubbard, who I'd never heard of. It's the first time I heard his name. And so next thing I know, I'm winding through the dark streets of East Nashville trying to find this guy's studio. You know, my whole world's falling apart. I'm just like, oh, God. And I walk in and we just start talking an hour, half later, we're still talking. And I thought, I love this guy. And it's like, oh yeah, we got to record Rainbow Road. So I just went and did it like one take, bam, three minutes. We got it. I was ready. And he said, man, we should do a whole album together sometime. So five years later, that's what happened. But in the meantime, Nielsen not only plays drums, plays all kinds of instruments, writes great songs, produces music. He, he's, photography is really his one of his favorite loves and he also produces videos so he asked me to he was shooting a video for Gretchen Peters a song called Arguing with Ghosts Paul check it out go to YouTube and check it out it's a badass video and they wanted me to play like an this old ghost I play a ghost in the video <laughs> didn't realize I've always wanted to be a ghost I'm a good ghost man but um while we were filming it we were we were up in Kentucky at kind of out in the rain and mist at this um, old outdoor drive-in movie set. You know, it was where people drive up in their cars to watch movies. You remember those? You know, they had those little metal posts that come up out of the ground, all those where you stick the speaker in your car so you can hear while you're watching the movie at a drive-in movie. So that's where we were shooting this part of this video And Nielsen had a camera with him as well as shooting video. And he took these pictures. One of them is the cover, now the cover of this record. He he took that shot and I didn't know he was taking it. We were taking a break from filming (laughs) and I hate having my picture taken. So it's great that he, he, he just nailed it. And, and he said, he he was so happy with the picture. He drove down from Kentucky. He said, Marshall, I got to show you this picture. And I'm sitting here looking at it on my wall. Well, that picture, this is so weird. Whoever that woman is in the picture, this, who I was that day in the drizzling rain after my world had fallen apart, trying to shoot a video with these guys. She told me what to record on this record, you know. I mean, it's weird, but I'd look at that picture and think, okay, what is that person going to record? I know this. Is this too cosmic for you? No, <laughs> you've got me. <laughs> so anyway... That's kind of how it happened. So anyway, I, I don't know. I just, I sent him a text last, about a year ago. And I said, I'm ready to go in the studio with you guys. And so we booked to get, and so Will Kimbrough, and they, they wanted to bring in a guy named Danny Mitchell, who I'd never heard of. He's a genius keyboard player. And he, he also played flugelhorn on that, um, that old Chet Baker. I call it a Chet Baker song. It was written by uh, Sammy Kahn and Jewel Stein. But Chet Baker recorded it on his album, Chet Baker Sings. I fall in love too easily. I've always loved that song. Will had to teach me. It has, it's a jazz song, so jazz is not really, I'm usually more three chords than the truth, but I love those old Torch songs. So I had to learn some jazz chords to learn how to play that. But it just all turned out. It, I'm, so I'm in the studio with these young guys, and they're so talented. and And it just, it just happened. I, I feel like we just captured some magic, and it's a great feeling. You know, I mean, you know, we human beings, we're all putzing around trying to, you know, just get into the grocery store is a big deal and just putzing around in our lives. But when you create something, like you create a song or you create an album or you create a book, it's sort of your chance to get something right. <laughs> the rest of the time you're just kind of muddling around so it felt great yeah thanks I'm glad you like it one of the things about this album is you know you were just mentioning a second ago this uh, song that was famously recorded by Chet Baker but it's not often that you have an album that has the songs of Bob Seger Johnny Cash <laughs> Leonard Cohen a standard a gospel song and it all flowed together I, I Yeah, that's what Tommy said. You know, the fact, the miracle is that she managed to make this whole thing flow together. He said, like an opera, you know, but, you know, I'm. 
Paul, I'm real old fashioned when it comes to making records because I know now kids just download one song that they listen to and put it on their iPods or they don't even have iPods anymore, their iPhones playlists or whatever. But I really do make an album for somebody to like stick in their, and they don't, when you buy a new car now, they don't even have CD players in them. But I do, I make an album to be listened to from the first song to the last song. I want it to flow together like one organic work of art. And, and that's what I strive to do. And, and it can, the way one song flows into the next, it, it, it's all determined by feel and sound, the key it's played in, what the song's saying, the feel of it, and just to have it. And, and when we finished the record, there was an, you know, at first, and I started writing, don't tell anybody, but I started writing songs. I hadn't really written a song that I was, other than a song about, that I wrote when, while Vanderbilt was winning, winning the College World Series. I wrote a song called Omaha that I loved. It'd probably be on my next record. But I wrote a blues song while we were in there. And, and, and also we had the recording of, of the song I wrote that had Rainbow in it, Rainbow in My Mind, which I had a good recording on. We were going to put that on there. But So I had songs that I'd written. And then I thought about doing a double CD. Like one CD would be songs I've written and then the other one would be you know, songs I, I can't live without. You know, we did about 15 songs, and normally I put 11 songs on a record, but we got it down to nine because it just sounded so right. But at first, the last song on the record was a song that we recorded called Chilly Winds. Do you know that song? It was written by John Stewart, the great John Stewart, and John Phillips, who, no. who was the head of the Mamas and the Papas. And John Stewart took Dave Gard's place in the Kingston Trio, and then he did his solo career. And he's, he's one, And I met him when he was in Nashville recording Cannons in the Rain for RCA. I was at all those sessions, you know, like Gidget just goes to the studio, mouth agape, listening to this great art being made. And he wrote, if you hadn't heard of him, he wrote Daydream Believer. That was his big hit. I think the Monkees had a hit on it or something. Oh. But he's a great artist. Check out Check out his album, Cannons in the Rain. And I think it's got Chilly Winds on it, actually. He recorded that. So, and I always loved it. You know, I wish I was a headlight on a westbound train. I'd shine my light on that cool Colorado rain. I'm going where those chilly winds don't blow. And it really fit my mood at the time. But it wasn't strong enough, you know. And I thought, this album's got Tower of Song, which that was the song that scared me the most. I had to throw down a swig of Weller's bourbon to go out and sing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always have the bourbon sitting in the studio. I never drink. I just have it there in case of an emergency. And that was an emergency. I wanted something like bookends as strong as I wanted. Some, you got to end with a really strong song and it wasn't strong enough. And so we back, we, we backed off and then I think, you know, we'd been in the studio and I think then I wrote Omaha and I wanted to record that and another new song. So we went back in the studio and I got the idea. I said, I'm going to end this album <laughs> and friends that know me. And, you know, I've got this. The kind of reputation you can't ruin. Right. Um, I've got my badass rock and roll reputation to live up to. And all of a sudden I'm going to record a gospel song. OK, <laughs> great. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to do a gospel song. And I, and I had it narrowed down to two songs, either, um, either, let's see, the one, like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall, I shall not be moved. Yeah, because I loved Pop Staples' version of that. And, um, and then I thought of, he's got the whole world in his hands, because that's the first song I remember singing as a child. And and so I decided I was going to do, he's got the whole world in his hands. But then I thought, Marshall, this is probably the dumbest song. Like every child knows that song when they hear it for the first time. And it's a really, musically, it's really dumb song. I mean, it's real simple. When I say dumb, I always mean that as a compliment. But, but it's, um, and it's been recorded by so many people. I went online and saw Johnny Cash sang it on his TV show. There's a YouTube video of him singing it with Linda Ronstadt singing the Little Bitty Baby's verse. And Dolly Parton recorded it. And I listened to everybody's version. I thought, you know, you're going to have to do something 
to make this stand out. And then that's when I got the idea for the recitation. So when I'm driving to the studio to record it, you know, I'm going to East Nashville. So I go from West Nashville. So I take the interstate on I-65 North, get off. I turned off on Trinity Lane. It was the day of the mass shootings within 24 hours in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. And when I turned off, all the flags were at half mass and I just pulled over to the side of the road and I wrote down the entire recitation that you hear at the end of he's got the whole world in his hands. I wrote it down word for word and that's how I did it in the studio. And, and you can hear it when it said, and Lord, I worry about my country. Hmm. I want my country to be, to be a beacon. And you can hear it on the word beacon. When I say that word, my voice cracks is cause I was, I was crying when we were recording it because my heart was so heavy worrying about everything that goes on here in our country. But talk about a timely, uh, you know, the, the release. It's so weird. <laughs> I mean, we recorded this a year ago and now we've got this coronavirus. And, you know, I wanted, I knew who I wanted to work with as far as a radio promoter and, and, and the publicist. And when I contacted I'm not going to say which one, but one of them, they, he didn't want to work with me because he said, are you going to tour? And I said, no, because touring was one of the contributing factors to the dissolution of my marriage. Is that the word dissolution? You could Disintegration you could of my marriage. It's one of those D words. But anyway, it was a contributing factor to the end of my marriage was being on the road so much. I thought, I'm not doing the road. It's just too hard. You know, unless you're willing, got your own bus and your own crew kind of cushioning you, cushioning you and your own, you know, nutritionist on board the bus and a masseuse and everything else. It's just too hard. I said, I'm not doing the road anymore. So they said, well, you're not going to sell any records if you don't do the road. And I said, well, let's just do first things first. So I kind of talked him into it. And now, I mean, I hate to say it because there's, people dying and we've none look no closer than our own beloved John Prine right here in Nashville has died of the coronavirus. And it's tragic what's going on and people's lives are being affected. But as far as this record I'm putting out, I even joked the other day and said, this virus has caused this record to go viral. I mean, it's, you know, the first digital single they put out was the, He's got the whole world in his hands. And I can't tell you the emails and even letters I've received from people that just, they're sitting at home listening to this, you know, quarantine. I think people are more thoughtful right now. It's a very, and that was another thing that the radio promoter, I mean, they didn't want to work with me because they said it's an album of covers and, and it's kind of a down. They thought it was too down for radio and all that. But if you listen to especially outlaw country and stuff. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon and putting out, oh, we got to pull together and all that. But this record was done purely not because, you know, it was way before the corona. I finished recording it a year ago. So I wasn't thinking about no coronavirus. You know what I mean? But it does seem to resonate with, with the world the way it is right now, with the people who are hearing it in this world the way it, the world is right now. And I'm happy. And that's great. I'm glad that it's people are finding it comforting. I don't know what to say. It's resonating. Absolutely. Speaking of John Prine, did you know him? Yeah. Yeah, and I've got a great story. The last time I saw him, a friend of mine, Arthur Hancock, was in town. Arthur Hancock, that's a whole interview right there. We could talk all day about him. Arthur Hancock recorded a bunch of albums with Fred Foster, you know, Monument Records. They were buddies. But Arthur, I met Arthur in the early 70s. And um, we went out, we went out a few times, but, but we've remained lifelong friends. And Arthur, when I met him, he had been disowned, just been disowned by his father. With his father was the late, great Bull Hancock, who owned Claiborne Farms, which is one of the most respected thoroughbred breeding farms in America. And, and, and it, 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 they even bred Man of War, one of the greatest racehorses. And also Arthur's brother, Seth Hancock, handled the syndication of Secretariat, 
Well, when I met Arthur, he'd been disinherited by his father because he was a badass alcoholic. He used to do all this wild shit. So the father left everything to Seth, the younger brother. And so the, the namesake and heir apparent was just put out to pasture. And, you know, they, he left him like 100 acres, left Seth Claiborne with its 6,000 acres and left Arthur 100 acres with a little stone cabin on it. So Arthur was determined that he was going to grow that farm you know, and he ended up getting sober and marrying this wonderful woman and having five kids. And, 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 but the thing about Arthur is he always wanted to be a songwriter, but he inherited sort of this legacy of, of horses. So he ended up with a small, a couple of brood mares and, a and long story short, his father, even though he bred some Kentucky Derby winners, he never he never actually raced a one he owned that won the Kentucky Derby. Well, Arthur entered one of his horses in 1982, a horse named Gato del Sol, 30 to one shot. He wins the Kentucky Derby first time. And sitting in his box with him in the winner's box, I was watching it on TV, was Fred Foster from Monument Records, you know, because they're good buddies. And then the next horse he ran was Sunday Silence. And it was named Sunday Silence because of Sunday morning coming down. And that fits into the story, too. And, of course, Sunday Silence won in 1989. So he ended up having two Kentucky Derby winners. And his father, Bull Hancock, although he bred winners, he'd sell them, you know, when they were when they were yearlings. And, and he never actually owned a Kentucky Derby winner. But Arthur owned two that, that ran and won. Backing up. So Arthur's wife had to have her knee replaced. So they drove down from Paris, Kentucky, outside of Lexington. They drove down to Nashville to her get her knee replaced. And then he was down here when she had to go to her first physical therapy session. So he called me and he, they're down at the Vanderbilt Plaza right down the street. So I went down there. He had his guitar with him as always. And we sat down and played a few songs for each other. And he said, well, let's go pick up Stacy, his wife. So we went to Centennial to the physical therapy right there at Centennial whatever it's called, the Frist, I can't remember what it's called, Frist Center, I think, at Centennial Hospital. So we, we go, and his wife comes out. She said, y'all aren't going to believe who was on the bike next to me in physical therapy, John Prime. Well, Arthur's eyes just got his big, and, it, and here's his wife, you know, we're trying to help her, picking her up in this big-ass SUV and get her all squared away. Arthur said, oh, my God, I, I just got to meet John Prime. I said, well, I know John. Yeah, you know, I toured with John in 80, 1989 and 1990. I opened a bunch of shows for him in California and South Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia. We we played the, the center theater. I opened for him there. And and so he'd had, you know, so we've been on the road together. And first time I played Bad Debt at Bogies here in Nashville, John Prime was in the audience. And I wrote about this in my book. Let me get some water. But he came up to me after the show, after I sang my song, you know, you hang around me like a bad debt. You haven't taken out the garbage yet. I must be crazy. I'm the one that let, I let you hang around me like a bad debt. He came up to me after I sang that. The first time I ever sang it with a band was at Bogies in Nashville. And Prime came up to me afterwards. He said, Marshall, when are you going to stop picking on us? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so Arthur and I, I said, yeah, I'll introduce you to John. I said, because I just had my knee scoped and Chris had just had his knee. Chris is my former husband who I'm now dating. And Chris had just had his knee replaced. So we knew the people down there at physical therapy pretty well. They're, they're not supposed to let you come in unless you're working out. And I said, there's a chance they won't let us in, you know, because they don't not supposed to let you in unless you're working out. So we abandoned Arthur's wife. There she is on crutches in the parking lot with the car. And we just take off and go running back in the building. You know, let her fend for herself with her newly replaced knee. And we walk in, and there's John. I see him from the back. And we walk up, and he's lying down on something. So I'm kind of looking down at him. And I told him this story that Arthur had told me earlier that day. When when Fred Foster was, was recording Arthur, he wanted him to hear some songs, wanted Arthur to hear some songs written by this songwriter that Fred had just signed. What's his name? Beckett. Bob Beckett. I think that's his name. That had combine music. Anyway, he had this new songwriter. He brought him in to play some songs for Arthur to record. Well, it was Chris Christopherson. 
And Chris had just written, help me make it through the night. And he sings it, help me make it through the night. He pitches it, sits down and right there at Arthur's feet, sings him the song for Arthur to record. And Arthur passed it. And Arthur said his mindset was, I don't need anybody helping me make it through the fucking night. You know, I'm 10, I'm 10 feet tall, bulletproof. What the hell? I need somebody to help me make it through the night. That's the wimpiest song I've ever heard. He hated it. So we told when we went to Pry and I, I introduced him. I said, this is Arthur Hancock. John, he's, he's a songwriter, a singer from up in Kentucky. He's also got horses and stuff, but he was friends with the late, great Fred Fall. Yeah, yeah, great. And I told him the story of, of him turning down that what I just told you about him turning down, help me make it through the night. And as we were walking away, John kind of turned around and looked at us with that kind of impish look that he had. And he said, uh, help me make it through the night. Don't need nobody's help. Didn't need nobody's help, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was. And, and I thought that was the last thing I heard him say. And, and Arthur and I were talking recently and I said, God, I feel so bad. And Arthur remembers everything. Fred Foster used to call him the sponge because he said Arthur's memory is so sharp. I said, I just wish I'd told him I loved him. He said, Marshall, you did. That's the last thing you said to him. He said, John, I love you. He said, I love you too, Marshall. So that's a sweet story. That's the last thing John Prine and I said to each other. I mm -hmm. said, I love you, John. He said, I love you too, Marshall. After he said, help me make it through the night, didn't need nobody's help. <laughs> Beautiful. Working our way back to the, the album, Songs I Can't Live Without. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be my guardrail, because I'll go off on a tangent, as you know. It's, it's all good here. <laughs> okay. There's a moment in the album that it just comes at the right moment, and I'm talking about Don't Be Cruel. Isn't it true that you once saw Elvis Presley in concert? Well, yeah. I mean, I saw him. I saw Elvis twice live. I saw him in Atlanta at the Omni on that last year that he toured before. Well, it was actually before that. I think it was about 19. Yeah, it was five years before he died. I saw him in 1972, but he was, it was obvious then he was not a well man, even though he still had the pipes, you know? And um, I was down there playing some happy hour. I hadn't even started writing songs yet. And I think Audie Ashworth, who, who managed JJ Kale, he was a friend of mine and Audie, had a friend that had a bar down in Atlanta or something. They wanted somebody down there playing songs. So he sent me down there to play happy hour in some bar in Atlanta, right in the middle of town. And when I got out of my gig, I was going to put my guitar back in my car and somebody, there was just a sea of people. I was almost being swept along the sidewalk. I said, what's going on? They said, Elvis is playing. And so I grabbed this kid that was selling tickets and took him up to the counter. I said, is this ticket good? And they said, yeah. And so I handed the kid, whatever I handed him 20 bucks walked in and naturally I was in the back. I was in the very back row, the nosebleed section. And you, they had some comic up there going through his routine and you, you know, you couldn't tell if it was Elvis up there or, or you up there. You know, I was so far away. Everybody just looked like ants. So I thought this isn't any good. So I noticed there were four empty seats during the first half. So during intermission, after the comic, I, I made my way to one of those four seats. And the people around me said, you're going to get bounced out of this seat. These are Elvis's personal seats for, you know, Vernon and his girlfriend and, and his family. They're going to make you move. They're going to make you move. And I turned around and said, y'all shut up. If anybody says anything, you know, <laughs> just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> let's, let's, let's let this thing unfold. Don't bust me. Come on. So by the time, and then all of a sudden the lights went down and it started, dun, 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 dun. you know, they start doing that, whatever it is, 2001 Space Odyssey or whatever it is. And then they start playing, you know, his comp the music, he'd walk out on stage and here he comes on stage. Well, right when the lights went down, here came Vernon, Ginger, his girlfriend, and, um, and his karate instructor, there were three of them and there were four empty seats and they came in. So I'm sitting next to his karate instructor on the other side of him is Vernon Presley. And on the other side of him is his girlfriend, Ginger. And, um, and, and I got to, I was on the fourth row and like his sweat and stuff. It was dripping on us. That's how close I was. So it was pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> but, but, but he was overweight. 
and bloated, didn't look healthy, but he was great. He was great. And of course, yeah, I saw him when I was seven years old. You know, my parents were out of town and we had a everybody, everybody in the South. This was the Jim Crow South. We had a black cook who also babysat for us when my parents would be gone. And she said, come on, we go. It's all in my book. So how do you come to martialize a song? How do you develop your own rendition of a song? I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> I just shower and show up. I can't, I can't tell you just, that, that's a question I can't answer. Did it feel very different for you being in the studio singing so many of these classics written by other people? It was it just felt like the thing to do. I, I was really surprised I did this record. And that was another criticism I got when I was trying to put a team together to help us work the record. That was like, they, they're not, they don't like to play. They don't like to play songs sung by other people. And I said, let's look at this positively. I mean, I feel like it gives you a leg up because that people already know the songs, you know? It's like something familiar to them but they're hearing it in a new way. I'm not trying to be different. I mean, you know, when I, I, that said, it, when I did, he's got the whole world in his hands, I did think it was going to need a, a, some sort of twist. You know, that's, I decided, I don't know why I just did the recitation. It just, sometimes I feel like I'm just receiving these things from some higher power. Marshall, you need to do a recitation. Okay. So I'm not smart enough to whatever. There's one song on the album when I was when I was looking at the album uh, the the copy my eyes immediately went to it. I love this song. It's not that well known of a song. I'm talking about Tennessee Blues written by the late Bobby Charles. Oh man, yeah. I love that you know that song. Do you have do you have the while we're talking I'm going to go back to my computer right now and send you something so I don't forget. Do you have the stories behind the songs? I wrote an essay right after we finished recording. I don't have that. I'm going to send it to you. Hold on a minute. I'll do it right now. Let me get my eyes. I got to get my glasses. Hold on a minute. Well, I can send it to you afterwards, but where did I put my glasses? Oh, this is a little game I play with myself. I hide my glasses. Oh, there they are. Okay. Yeah. So what have you gotten in the mail? Are you on Carrie's mailing list? Did he send you the CD? Yeah, he sent me the CD and he sent me, uh, uh, it was a it was a one sheet press release, but it was mostly quotes from people. Yeah, that seems to be the hip. <laughs> All right, at gmail.com. And I'm going to send you this right now. Yeah, this is a little essay because what I'm doing, when people order it, I'm including signed copies of this essay as sort of a little bonus for the pre-orders. That's what we're doing. As promised. Nice. That's what I got on it. So I'm sending it to you right now. And it just tells, I wrote an essay that is sort of the story of how Nielsen and I came to record this record together. The one I told you about recording Rainbow Road and then how we ended up doing the album. And then it's the stories behind every song and why I chose that song. And the Bobby, getting back to Tennessee blues, that's cool. You picked that out because the story behind that, I'll just read it to you. I'll read, I'll read to you people out there. Beautiful. Yeah. Here's the story behind that. Cause I just sent it to you. Tennessee blues. Here we go. It's just a little thumbnail. I first heard this song when Tom Paul Glazier recorded it at Glazier Sound Studios in Nashville in 1976. I was there to sing background vocals. I've always thought Tom Paul's version was one of the greatest recordings ever to come out of Nashville as far as raw emotion. Fast forward 40 years. I'm on location for a film called Love Song. We're in a house on the banks of the Cumberland River just beyond where Opryland, USA used to be. I'm sitting on a bed in an upstairs bedroom. By the way, I was sharing that those bedroom quarters with uh, Elvis Presley's granddaughter, who's co-starred in this film. She's a really fine actress. I'll think of her name in a minute. She's great. 
Lisa Marie is her mother. It's December 2014. I'm sick as a dog with the infection that two weeks later would have me quarantined at St. Thomas Hospital. I knew something wasn't right, but I just thought I was tired because of my divorce and my mom's death. To keep my soul alive, out of the blue, I started jotting down the lyrics to Tennessee Blues from Tom Paul's version that was on my iPhone. Then I started singing. You know, you have to wait a lot when you're making movies. So I started singing it over and over. I would sing it as it perfectly expressed how I felt at the time. Beam me up, Scotty. (laughs) So that's that. It's a great song. You did it so well. Yeah. Thank you. No. Thank you. Check out check out Tom Paul's version too. I'll have to check it out. It'll break. It'll kill you. I always thought Tom Paul's voice, like if Richard Burton had been a country singer, he would have been Tom Paul Glacier. <laughs> you know. And now I'm I'm going crazy. I'm looking up. I've got to get the name of this actress down. Lisa Marie Presley daughter there she is where's the daughter riley kyo that's her name you've heard of her she's a great actress riley what's she's your last really name? really good riley kyo k-e-o-u-g-h okay yeah riley you know when you're making movies you, you spend a lot of time you get to know the people you're working with and <laughs> it comes very much like family because you're all you know out somewhere and it's raining on location and you're all under the same tent eating food, getting ready for the shoot. Everybody, it's a very, people don't realize, you know, you see movie stars and everybody's bigger than life on the big screen. But when you're actually recording the movie, it's very, uh, you're all kind of in the same boat. And it seems like everybody's egos are checked at the door or whatever, because I've never run into that star stuff as as much as I even see it in Nashville. It doesn't seem to exist in the, at least in the movies I've worked in. Maybe I've just been lucky, but you're all, it's almost like the movie is the star and everybody's just being the best they can be because they want the movie to be good, you know, and everybody's trying to do the best they can. And so it's a great leveler, you know, whether you're sitting there at lunch with Gwyneth Paltrow or the best boy, you know, it's, it's, Everybody's the same. Do you like it? Yeah, I like. I, 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 I like. I like the. Um, yeah, I do. I did. A, I've done. I've only done about five or six movies, but I've enjoyed every experience. Was great. I've never had any bad experiences. It's intense. It's intense as hell. It's in a lot of ways. It's more intense than making uh, making records. I mean, movies are. When you make a movie, you're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars. And that alone, when that spot camera is on you and it's your time to do what they're paying you to do, how is it? you just, with that much money on the line, you just better not fuck up. You know, <laughs> you better remember your line. <laughs> and so um, it's, I don't know. It becomes, it, it's, it's like, whatever it is becomes real. It becomes real. Hmm. It just, I remember the first time I I did the first one, which was that country strong. I remember driving home from the first time I was on the set and I had bonded so quickly with everybody I was working with. And that beca- it become the whole set and the scene, it becomes your reality. When I was driving home and, and when I walked in my house, all of a sudden I was looking at my house. Like I, it felt like I'd never been there before. Like, what is this? You know, in other words, all your reality up until then, I don't know how to explain it, it gets obliterated and you, 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 you get into this character. It's, it's just another way of taking a vacation from yourself because you get to inhabit a character, just like I'm inhabiting these songs for um, songs I can't live without. You know, when I went to treatment, they, they said that's why people take drugs. It's why people, alcoholics drink. It's why drug addicts take drugs. It's to escape. They want everybody. Want, it's why people get obsessed about religion. It's why people, you know, whatever. It's it's all about transcending yourself. Because if you're all wadded up in yourself, that's you're miserable. And so everybody's looking for a way. It's why people go to movies. Why people listen to music. It's why people create. It's a way of transcending yourself. And so that's what when you 
that's been my experience with making movies. It's it's just a great way to transcend yourself because you become the character, and you're thinking about that. All the songs on this album, this is no place to be humble. I, I want you to just just tell me what song do you think was a knockout? Well, the thing I love about one of the things I love about recording an album of songs I didn't write is I can brag about these songs all I want to. And nobody's going to think I'm conceited because I didn't write any of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're asking me to pick a favorite? It's like Sophie's Choice, man. <laughs> I'll tell you, as far as sheer, let me look. I got to look at the list here. I soon we forget. I'm going to go actually pick up a copy of it here. Let's see, what do we record here? Oh, my God. So what did you just ask me? I asked you, which song do you think on this album was particularly a knockout? Well, I think they're all a knockout for different reasons. But when it comes down to sheer saying the most with the least, I'd have to go with Tower of Song. It's like... Well, I'll read the thing. I'll read what I wrote about Tower of Song on this thing I just sent you. Tower of Song. I sang this song for the first time as we were running it down. We did another take, but the rundown was the keeper. I first heard Tower of Song on Cohen's 1988 album, I'm Your Man. But it wasn't until 2009 when I heard him sing it live at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center in Nashville, that it became embedded in my DNA. This song says everything there is to say about what it means to be a songwriter, the mortality of us human beings, the immortality of great art, and yes, regret. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Beautifully stated. Well, that's why I write instead of talk. That's why I hate doing interviews, and I'm at your mercy, because I'm sitting here. I can't even think the name of Riley Keough. That's pitiful. You know, speaking of songwriters, as you just, in that passage that you you recited, you wrote in the liner notes, you said, I'd like to thank all the great songwriters who have kept my soul alive all these years. Yeah. This is maybe a stream of consciousness, because there's, there's so many great writers, but who do you think the greatest songwriters around are and were? Who do I think the greatest songwriters around are and were? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I can't answer it. I plead the fifth or the first or whatever it is. I, I can't answer that. Fair enough. I mean, it's obvious that these nine, well, eight really, because nobody knows who wrote who's got the whole world in his hands. I probably don't even know who the greatest song is. Somebody over in East Nashville is probably writing it right now. <laughs> I don't even know. Well, you know, your own songs, they've been recorded by so many great singers. And I remember the first time I ever met you, and we were talking about Irma Thomas. But there's... Where, where did I first meet you? We met for the very first time. I had you autograph your... your was it f- when I was touring with Buffett? No, it was... Um, it was... Um, you were playing with Tommy Womack and Tim Crickle it, it is that. at Swallow in the Hollow, which is no longer there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, is it gone? That's it's too gone. bad. It was such a cool place. Yeah, it was. That was a sweet little setup they had up there. You know, I was so in awe of you, I was nervous to, to walk up to you. And I felt well, I felt like I had this book, so that was like a that was, I could I could hand you the book and you autographed the book. But um, you know, I remember we we talked about Irma Thomas and and you were mentioning some of the 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 singers and I know Emmy Lou Harris, Joe Cocker, John Hyatt. This is maybe also a difficult question, but of the people who interpreted one of your songs, who impressed you the most? Um. You mean pe- people who, other people who've recorded my songs? Yeah. God, let me look at the list of that. I'm 71 years old, man. You're making me remember shit. Let's stay in the moment. <laughs> Let's see. 
I'm going to my website. There's a thing on here that has songs. Marshall songs recorded by other artists. Here it is. I'm looking at the list. Um, well, this is crazy, but I really like Sawyer Brown's version of Betty's Being Bad. And they left the dumb horn parts that I had on my demo. They had them on there just exactly like they were, where they just bop, ba, you know, not trying to get smart. I really liked the way that came out. I thought it was great. They changed one of the lyrics because of country radio, but you know, I mean, I hate to pick say that, but I, I really liked. I thought that was it was a good record. But I was thrilled when I heard Joe Cocker's version of a song I wrote with Steve Davis called "Just to Keep from Drowning," and he sang it on the Tonight Show one time. And it wasn't the single. And I remember Johnny Carson said, "That's that's not the the single." He said, "No, it's just." What I wanted to do. I thought that was so cool. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I'll go with that. Sorry, I'm not doing very good. No, oh, no. Oh, Matrice... All right, here's one. This is even better. Matrice is the last one on the list because it begins with a Y. Matrice Berg and I wrote a song called Your Husband is Cheating on Us. Your Husband's Cheating on Us. And it's been, Matresa recorded it, and there's a group that just recorded it called The Likely Culprits. And it's actually a bunch of kids that are, are in somebody's backup band, like Garth Brooks or somebody. But it, one of them is Buddy Cannon's daughter, was the lead singer. They recorded it. But Trisha Yearwood recorded this song, and she friggin' nailed it. And it was on a fairly recent album of hers. Her version was totally badass. It's like when Matresa and I went to hear it, Matresa said, oh, I feel like such a pussy. <laughs> because Matresa had said, we've got to write this in the third person like there's a narrator because country radio will never accept this person, you know, being a home wrecker, you know. And so and when Trisha did it, she just put it right in the first person singular. And so when she heard, when Matresa heard that, she said, God damn, I feel like such a pussy because she had recorded in the third or anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that version's great. I got, I mean, I got really, I got chills. You know, you write a song and you think, yeah, this is really good. And then another artist, usually when another artist sings one of my songs, I cringe because they just do something weird, you know. But in this case, when I heard Trisha's version of Your Husband's Cheating on Us, it knocked my socks off. And I felt the same way when I heard Sawyer Brown's version of Betty's Being Bad. And I love Buffett did some, he did some nice stuff. Jimmy Buffett. Oh, Buffett, yeah. And Buffett. Buffett has been so generous to me for a really long time, and and I consider him a good friend. But but I love, I love, you know, I love Last Mango in Paris. That was a beautiful recording of that song. Of course, that was a co-write with him and Will Jennings and Mike Utley. I think there were four writers on that, but I can remember when we, we wrote half that song on a boat out in the middle of you know, the ocean off, the sea off Key West. And then we wrote the second half of it in, a, in an apartment somewhere in Nashville. Hmm. That's, okay, what else you got? There's one song that Buffett recorded that I've always wondered how in the world this came to be. It's always puzzled me. Smart woman in a real short skirt. What about it? <laughs> how did that, what in the world was the inspiration? Was it, was there anything there? Well, I was on the I was in Buffett's band, I think it was nineteen eighty seven, and we, we were actually sitting at the Four Seasons Hotel in Hollywood or LA or wherever it is, and we were sitting there having a crab meat salad for lunch outdoors. It was a beautiful day. And I had brought down an Esquire magazine that I'd been reading that had an article in it about and I don't know if the article was called Smart Women in Short Skirts, but it but it had they had done an article, you know, trying to dispel the myth of bimbos wearing short skirts or something. But it was people like, you know, Gloria Steinem in a short skirt, you know, looking real sexy, as only Esquire would do. And so I showed it to Jimmy and he said, I oh, wish you'd write a song, <laughs> Smart Woman in a Real Short Skirt. And I, and that's all 
that's all he said. And then later he was recording and I thought, I just, I just started writing down lyrics and I sent, I think I faxed them to him or something. And then he faxed me back. It was one of those deals where we faxed back and forth and, uh, and then he recorded it. I appreciate you letting me go off the beaten path a little bit, but, uh, the, the songs I can't live without album. Yeah. When somebody listens to that, what, is there anything in particular you hope they get from it? I just hope they enjoy it. You know, I'm not trying to change the world or anything. I just, uh, I hope they're able to transcend themselves. (laughs) I I don't know what to say. I, I just, you know, I'll tell you in all honesty, when, when you're creating something, the fact that there's somebody out there who's actually going to take the time to listen to me, it's always shocking. I mean, I'm just, just sitting here talking to you, knowing you've listened to the record. It's, it's a real humbling thing, believe it or not. It's like, wow, he took the time and listened to that and actually got some of it. That's so cool. Well, what would you say is the best compliment you've ever received? Wow, man, you're killing me. Um, I'm not very good at taking compliments. <laughs> I'd rather give them. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Let's. See. Okay. I'll read you one. Let's see. So glad I'm at my computer. I'm gonna let my computer be my brain. How's that? All right. Let's go in here to Blaze of Glory. I got a letter. Remember the guy, that writer, that. Tom Robbins that wrote Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. And you, you know who he is. He's a great, great book writer. Oh, you, I, I, author. The name is... Tom Robbins. Hold on a minute. Jitterbug, Jitterbug Perfume. Maybe that'll ring a bell. You know, I'll Google him. Let's see. Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. It was made into a movie with Uma, Uma Thurman. Let's see. Another Roadside Attraction, he wrote that. Here's books. Another Roadside Attraction, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, Jitterbug Perfume, Fierce Invalids Home from Hot Climates. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway. A prolific novelist. He's a a great writer. And he's real, it's kind of like Hunter Thompson a little bit. You feel like you're tripping when you read his writing. He wrote me a letter, and I wish you could see it. It's, it's stationary. He calls his house Villa de Jungle Girl at Post Office Box in Laconner, Washington. And this was written on June 17, 2013. Dear Marshall, this is a compliment. If you want to know the greatest compliment I've had, I think it was this letter from him. Your blaze of glory finally caught up with me, your CD, not your condition. Or I caught up with it, and I feel cheated that it took me so long to listen. Your voice, your lyrics are ringing all the bells in my brain. Seriously, it's the best album I've heard in a long, long time, and that includes the latest from my friend Bonnie Raitt, which is pretty damn good itself. Ranks and tanks and banks and shanks and hanks, Mr. Williams would have dug it too. So thanks for thinking of me. This baby is a beauty and not a penny less. If it were in my power, I'd cancel the Grammys this year and just load all the awards in a wheelbarrow and dump them at the foot of your bed. Congratulations. That's a compliment, isn't it? I'll say. (laughs) That that might be the the grandfather of compliments. (laughs) Very nice. And he signed it, Love, Beauty, Serenity, Novelty, Mystery, Mischief, and Mirth. Tom Robbins. Wow. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and his stationery has this graphic in the upper right-hand corner of this black panther hanging down from this branch with all his talons out, getting ready to claw this scantily clad woman in a, in like a, um, in a leopard skin bikini. And, but she's got a knife out. Like they're fighting. <laughs> they're getting ready to go. It's wild. <laughs> He sounds like he knows how to get attention. <laughs> well, or he's got a real good balance of yin and yang. <laughs> That's how I look at it. 
I always like to end the interview. I, I always give the guest the stage where they can go wherever they want. What would you say to anyone who's tuned in? Huh? Oh, God, you're killing me. <laughs> you, I, 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 I don't. you got me on the spot. I can't do it. It has to be spontaneous. I think I've gone off on enough tangents where you probably got a plenty. Well, Marshall, you've been very generous with me. Yeah, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't answer questions as, as well as I do go off on tangents. I don't know. Ask me something. <laughs> Ask me something I can answer. Well, what makes a good song a good song? What makes a good song a good song? A good song can't be denied. It's what makes anything good. Wow. A good song gra- grabs you. The very first, the very first word you hear, the very first line, it grabs you and it, it doesn't let go. Hmm. I hate when I'm writing a song and the first line is really good and it's like, oh shit, because you know you've set the bar really high. <laughs> what would you say makes a great singer? A great singer is just any singer whose voice is connected to their soul. Oh, that's a great question. I like answering this. A great singer is somebody whose voice is connected to their soul. And so when you hear them sing, they're connected to heaven. What an answer. Wow. Nice. Very nice. What else you got? (laughs) (laughs) No, you're not going to mount. All right, this is off the record. Okay. Case in point, Willie Nelson is a great singer, even though Billy Sherrill and all the powers that be at CBS didn't even want to release Redheaded Stranger because they said, hell, he can't sing, and that thing sounds like a demo, and the bass isn't even in tune. Who cares? It's great. Hmm. And um, he's a great singer because my mother did not like country music, but I gave my father... What was that album he did that had Stardust on it? Oh, yeah. Stardust. Stardust. Yeah. I gave him. <laughs> My parents listened to opera, you know, or, or you know, those that clarinet. What's his name? Glenn Miller. They listened to stuff like that. So I, I gave my father one time a CD. It's right when CDs had come out. I gave him Willie Nelson's Stardust. And he was sitting in the den listening to it. And all of a sudden, my mother's standing in the doorway. And whenever my mother doesn't approve of something, her, it's like her hairline goes back about an inch. And she's standing there with her hairline back. But well, then all of a sudden, her hairline kind of comes forward a little bit more. And she said, that man can't sing. And then a few more, she listened to it a little bit longer. And then she just shook her head. And she said, but I like it. And so that's why he's a great singer. Because he forces even my mother to like it. And who the kind of singers I can't stand are, and this is all off the record. This is off the record. Promise me, okay? I promise. But take Michael Bolton singing When a Man Loves a Woman. I'd rather listen to Cats Fight. And people think he technically, he has a great voice, but, but it's not connected to his soul. It's connected to his penis. Oh. You, might, you might, if you can work, if you can work that in somewhere, I'll stand by that. <laughs> oh man! Especially, especially, especially if, if you get your laughter in there, that would be great. <laughs> uh. That man's voice connected to his dick. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. I'm sorry. No need to apologize. Sometimes I just have to be, be bad. It, I will say this. It's going to be painful if I have to cut that out. They say, but well, they say if Betty's being bad, it's her way of leaving. I guess this interview's over now because I'm being bad. <laughs> 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 That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Hey, I love you, man. Thanks for um, thanks for calling me. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the, and thanks for listening to songs I can't live without. I I'm just. 
grateful I got to live long enough to make it. And there will be another album coming out as well? You know there might. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Because I'm having, we're having so much fun. Usually I hate this end of it, like the promoting and everything, but the fact taking going on the road out of the equation has turned it into a dream vacation, you know? This just staying at home, talking to you on the phone, updating my, I've been updating my emailing list. It's been, I had 9,000 people on my emailing list and, and it's like, it's been ignored for seven years. So I've been going through and updating everybody that bounced about 500 and about a thousand bounced, which isn't bad, Not but, bad. um, but it's, you know, but it's funny cause I've been using it as kind of an excuse. Cause sometimes there'll be somebody I know and I thought, God, I hadn't talked to her in a long time and I'll track her down. I just tracked down a friend of mine that booked me in all through Texas. Her husband founded the Armadillo world headquarters and she lived in Austin. I used to always stay at her house, you know, and her email bounced. And so I tracked her down. I found her, you know, she's divorced. She's living with one of her grandchildren in Indianapolis. And so I just, every morning that I wake up, I've been calling one person and catching up with people that have meant a lot to me in my life. And when you've lived as long as I have, that's a lot of people. And, um, and so that's how I start every day. I'll call somebody and we'll just catch up on the phone. It's just been great. So there you go. So for everyone out there, it's tallgirl.com. And Marshall Chapman, your voice is, is it's just great to hear you talk. I could I could I could listen to you talk forever. <laughs> well <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I don't think my former husband could say that, but I'm I don't know what to say. Thank you. My pleasure. You're a pleasure to interview and I hope we get to talk uh, another time. Well, I'm going to go be quiet now and sit at my computer and not say anything for about another five hours. So this is my, uh, it was a real pleasure visiting with you. My pleasure. Until next time. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Paul Leslie Hour. Hosted, written, and produced by Paul Leslie. Intro theme song, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Written by Irving Berlin. Performed by Dan Barrett. Outro scatting G things improvised, performed, and produced by John Goodwin. Until next time. Goodbye.